Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very honoured to be uh, talking to you people here because really and truly in, in terms of uh, professional archaeology, I am not a professional archaeologist. I am a member of the Marshland Institute, uh, which is an extraordinary uh, organisation because uh, they, they uh, our Marvellous Institute was uh, formed in Ireland in 1941 by a group of um, people who were passionate about the sea and realised that if Ireland was to progress, they would have to uh, get involved in the sea. And people in Ireland tended to always look at the, the land, not the sea. So it was to promote a greater awareness among the Irish people of the sea shipping, naval defences, offshore resources and all things maritime. Improvements in naval service met over many years from 1941, established of Irish shipping in 1941-84, National Museum, Dundee. Improvements in Met Airden in 1945, Institute Jack uh, in the Institute asked Jack Tyrrell in 1954 if he would design a sail and train in Brigantine, which became Ascard 1. Uh, the modernisation of the Coast Guard and the establishment of a VHF network. The first broadcast was made by the late Jim Mitchell in the, from the museum in Dunleary. Uh, and the, the, the base station was established in Dublin Airport. Now, up to 1991, there was three radio stations that could receive VHF signals. And that was Hollyhead, Belfast and Valencia. We had no facilities anywhere in Ireland other than those three stations. And most small PHFs on fishing boats couldn't reach that distance. So in 1991, this happened that a revolution occurred and now we have PHF coverage all over the country. And so that's what the Maritime Institute was all about. On the War of Cultural Heritage in Ireland, that came about in. Uh, you have to forgive me, uh, but this uh, slow and easy. In the spring of '85, the Office of Public Works asked. Uh, Ronnie Lewis, the then Vice President of the Maritime Institute, uh, could they, could, was there anybody within the Institute to brief them on uh, this? They were heading to Strasbourg, a team of uh, civil servants were heading to Strasbourg for the Convention of Underwater Wrecks. And uh, so we were asked, Ronnie Lewis uh, asked myself, and Dr. John de Corsi Ireland, who we all know, Lord rest him, uh, if we could brief the civil servants on the matter. The team was headed up by Enda Dunleavy of the OPW, and we gave uh, Enda and his team a full briefing of all that was going on around the Irish coast. Now, we in the Institute had reports of heavy uh, suction dredging equipment being used off the south coast. The Navy service had reported but there was no law in Ireland to prevent the wrecks from being interfered with. So subsequently, we, uh, we, a long debate of two or three hours took place and we briefed them. And in the briefing, I mentioned the, 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 the Servions in Bantry Bay. Now, I discovered a wreck of the Servions in Bantry Bay, purely by chance. A company called Irish Side of Data were doing a uh, side can stoner of Bantry Bay, and they were promoting their business. It was a new business, a new company, and they were promoting themselves, and the company was launched in the National Maritime Museum of Dunleary. And I saw this chart of Bantry Bay, and a little smudge, I thought, was a pencil mark or something. And I said to one of the surveyors, I said, could you identify it? Oh, he said, that could be a massive timber. And I took it down to the council room, and I got a magnifying glass and my heart skipped the beat. Because here was the outline of a ship with cannon, rigging, masts, everything. I couldn't believe it. And I knew from the shape of the ship 
that it was something very, very important. And I zipped that, told nobody about it, not even mentioned to the, the people on either side of that. I just kept quiet about it. And then, as I said to the Office of Public Works at the time, I said, we, we've got to just keep this under wraps until we have some law in place that can, what's called it, uh, do something about it, protect us. And uh, we subsequently then, I got a call from, uh, we, they, they went to Strasbourg and they came back and they thanked us very much. They said they were the best briefed uh, group from any country in, in the European Union. So we were quite pleased with that. And then Ronnie Lewis and the president of the Maritime Institute, uh, Maritime Institute at the time asked me would I head up some kind of a committee. And I did. And, and basically we called it the uh, Orders on the Water Heritage Committee. And uh, I picked people that I thought could be of great benefit. I was the chairman, Kevin Crullers. A young lady called Hazel Jack, whose dad was a member of the institute, an extremely good secretary, and Brendan Neary, our librarian uh, out in the institute in Dunleary, Dr. Morris Craig, famous historian, uh, Roy Stokes, diver, Bob Guntel, diver, Rory Golden, diver, Ness O'Connor, diver and archaeologist. They were my team. And we set about and the purpose of the, 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 the on the world cultural heritage was to bring an awareness of what we had around our coast and to bring the diving community because up to then people were just going down they were finding a wreck they were hacking bits off it selling it to pubs doing whatever and no historic records were being kept no records of where the, the, the pieces were coming from or anything else. So we set about trying to persuade the diving community, which we did eventually. Now, uh, in, where am I say, I'll just get onto the street, of which I'm sure you're all there. Uh, some of the projects we undertook were the wreck of the Queen Victoria. It was the wreck the only, the first wreck ever to have a preservation order placed on it in Irish history. Uh, the Servians in Banshee Bay, the Island Packet in Pope Marnock, the Taylor Land Bay, formation of UART, and health disaster no national monuments in Benford. Now in, uh, let me see, sorry. It's, the podium is not very, uh, I can't lay this out. I had a call from the, the Office of Public Works and uh, to say that a group of English divers had discovered a Spanish Armada wreck on the street of Strand. And I was asked to accompany them. And when we arrived, we met Stephen Birch, Alan King, Harry Chapman, and a group of the nicest people you could come across. And they asked us, if we could get a preservation order on the site. Now, being, me being an American John Buck, uh, when I was told it would take six months, I said to the Office of Public Work officials, no, I want this in 24 hours. Because I said, if the word gets out uh, that this wreck exists, there'll be none of it left unless we get a preservation order. And Harry Chapman and the whole gang were totally in, in agreement to this. They kitted me out in the dry suit, which was my first experience of a dry suit. It was the most beautiful feeling you could have after wet, diving in wet suits for years. But anyway, this is, these are some of the images we found. The guns and uh, our esteemed colleague, uh, previous colleague has a lot of these pictures all so this is a, a reproduction of the pictures but I was diving on a wreck that nobody had seen in 400 years I was I was dumbfounded I couldn't believe it and I was very pleased when I came ashore and 
confirmed that it was. And I then had the privilege of meeting my good friend Colin Martin. And uh, he confirmed uh, that it was the Julian. And uh, these are all the, the beautiful scenes that I discovered. That's myself in a dry suit, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, as I say, it, it was a most extraordinary experience. And people in Strida and this area don't realize what they have, the potential of this site. Is, 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 there isn't a site, uh, I, I, I don't know of a site in the world that has three Spanish Armada wrecks in, not intact, but to all in the, together. That's uh, Tony Balf. That's the ship's rudder. That is the most extraordinary piece because it's 35 feet long. It's intact. And it must be the only ship's rudder of that period that still exists. I, I worry that it's still there or it's still intact. Now, we're under restriction in time, so I won't go into it. That's the rudder again, you see it? You see all the, 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 the pieces and that uh, graphic that we had. Now, I was observing the wreck and we had a meeting in Sligo, we set up a meeting, a public meeting in Sligo, in the school hall. <coughs> and it was the most extraordinary experience because I've never seen so many people in a, such a small space. They were actually looking in the windows they were jammed in the doors, they were out on the street. It was so fantastic. And Alan King and his team put a whole package together. And unfortunately, uh, when the, there was three guns lifted, as, as a, my previous colleague said, there was three guns lifted and they were being transported to drum a hair by road in the back in a trailer owned by Alan King driven, uh, towed by a Land Rover, and we had guarded the, the sergeant nearly as an escort, as a, but the whole thing was done being done covertly. And they pulled into a garage between here and Drummer Hare to get diesel. And the curious pump attendant lifted the, the wet sack and then the canvas and spotted the guns. And when the, the guy drove off, he ran into his daddy and told him, that daddy, there's an English jeep gone up there with guns in the back of it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, guard, the guard in Sligo set up a, a roadblock. <laughs> because the whole thing was being done covertly. And of course, the media got their hands on it. And uh, certain gentlemen at the time, stood up on the television and he said, I won't allow these pirates to rob our heritage, you know. And it was the most, worst bit of publicity the whole project ever got. But anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, we, we carried on and right through the whole lot, uh, we had cooperation from these guys. Until one day, I was asked to deliver a letter I didn't know the contents of the letter, but when I went down, I was, I was the uh, observer appointed by the OPW to observe and make sure nothing went astray. And I handed him the letter, and he said, there was a change in attitude. And I said, what's wrong? And they were hostile to me. And he said, do you know what's in this letter? I said, I don't. Well, they tell you, I, we've been told not to interfere with the wreck, and if we did, the Irish Army diving unit would be sent down to protect the wreck. Now, talk about bad diplomacy, talk about bad management. That, it, it, to me, it, 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 it was so wrong. So anyway, the, the whole thing went pear-shaped, and hence it ended up with the coast. But in the meantime, we proposed a, uh, we made a proposal to the government 
That's the butter shit. That's a, a diver in the skies. <laughs> <laughs> They're the marks that were placed on the beach to mark where the wrecks were. And somebody asked earlier uh, what depth uh, the, the wrecks were in. Roughly 20 to 30 feet of water, because these ships drew that type of draft. So when they hit, when they came into 20, 30 feet of water, they hit the bottom. And it must have been a horrific thing because that gale on that particular time, that's the diving team there all uh, kitten up and <laughs> launching their, their inflatables. And that's them there. So very professional, very good divers, very nice people. That's all I can say. This is now, on one occasion when we were diving, uh, I got a, I was diving on the Juliana at the time, and I got a call to say that there was a, they found a swivel gun, and uh, <coughs> the, the, the boat that I had gone out and first took me down to the other side where the boy was, and we dived down onto the site, and here at the bottom of the shot line was this beautiful swivel gun. Now I'm not saying that that particular swivel gun, because unfortunately I got a call from home to say that my wife had taken suddenly seriously ill and she was going in for emergency surgery. But anyway, uh, she subsequently survived grand. But I had to leave the site and I often wondered about that swivel gun and I saw a picture of it, so I assume it was recovered it's safely. But it was so small, you could have taken it up without lifting equipment. It was the most beautiful thing you ever saw and the breach was loaded. It was just extraordinary. So if anybody here thinks that the, the site is not worth looking at, and it hasn't got a tourist potential, it has. There's the site and there's the, the, the lads out on the, the water. Now, my proposal is all about that lake there, that, uh, what call it? Now, see where we have a big lagoon at the back of the strand there. My proposal was that we excavate that lagoon and we use it as a holding pen. And that teams of archaeologists and amateur divers. Now, this is a, a, a case where this is, we moved this one gun to, uh, to, from Drummer Hare by Security Corps van, and to get that gun to the National Maritime Mu Museum in Dunleary, <coughs> I had to jump through so many hoops. I persuaded Security Corps to do this for free of charge. And that was the only way I could, uh, the gun was valued at 18,000 pounds, and I had the responsibility, and I had to travel with the Security Corps people all the way to Dublin. And, uh, that's it there, a beautiful gun, and that's us, in, that's my, uh, myself and my uh, youngest son, and we're preparing to lift the, that's a tank I made, we're using 3.8 plate glass, and uh, that's it there. And we, see the, the cannonball down the, But uh, the little story attached to that because we, we what's called it, we, we placed the gun in the, in the bottom of the tank and uh, we decided we'd fill the tank full of water and get washed sand and put a few seashells in and make it look pretty. <laughs> this is the morning that the Spanish ambassador is arriving in the afternoon to open the exhibition and it wasn't washed sand. It was dirty sand, muddy sand, and the whole thing had to be pumped out. And my wife had to rush out with my good suit and everything else. I was supposed to be meeting the ambassador. And I was down in the council room after cleaning myself up, and we had to pump all the water out and put fresh water in. And I, <laughs> anyway, it was a, one of these hectic days. But they were the three guns that were recovered in, in uh, and brought to Drummer Hare. And when they were brought to Drummer Hare, uh, we, I asked the Office of Public Works to make, to 
tanks of our uh, 9 by 3 planks and then line them with whiz cream and fill them full of water. And that's what we did. Now this was a, a what Mr. Nealon said at the time, as you can read it. He said that uh, there should be a museum in Sligo when he would support the project. I don't know what he did. And uh, there's a, a report uh, I sent to the, the, the site operation in relation to the street armada. Unfortunately, it's not very clear. But basically, uh, what I said in brief was that the lagoon should be provided at the back of the beach, that porta cabins be set up, walkways, palisade fence, research lab, accommodation block, the whole lot, and I, I priced out the whole lot, including inflatable boats at the time, and I worked out at 300,000 pounds, which I consider a small investment, but which could end up being a, a great project, project that people could come and see the conservation work in place. They could watch it, there could be models made locally, that could be verified by the Maritime Institute or some other authority to say that there were genuine Spanish Armada models. And th the whole potential was so great and uh, it just fell on deaf ears. I carried on with uh, my work and uh, I what's called continued uh, forward and uh, bringing forward underwater archaeology in Ireland. And I eventually formed an operation called UARC, Irish Underwater Research Team. And, uh, that they, and I, by the time I'd finished, I had 10 divers trained up in part one of the underwater archaeology course uh, to British standards. And uh, I had a team of people that I could call on uh, at a drop of a phone call. And uh, you know, and it, it was great. And after that, my job was done because that's what I set out, like all things with the Maritime Institute, we don't run things, we get things up and moving. And I appeal to politicians, and I appeal to the people of Strida to drive forward with a campaign that will actually get a museum, a small museum, it doesn't have to be huge, even this hall, and get a small museum in action, and get it up and running, even if it's only, and build on it. That's the only way you'll do this. If it's going to be left for massive money to be pumped into it, it's not going to happen. But it can be done in a controlled and perfect way. And what better way to... Oh, that's all. <laughs> what, what do I do? <laughs> yeah, I have my own legs. Sorry about this, folks. <coughs> Put that away. Yeah. But the, the whole idea is that uh, without the map, it's impossible. Uh, the whole idea is that really and truly, you couldn't ask for the better site with the lagoon at the back. And not only, you have a lagoon, and in digging the lagoon and excavating for the lagoon, it's very, very possible we might find remains, and these remains could be removed in a, a respectful manner and placed in a, a grave or some, get some kind of recognition. Because, let's face it, this wasn't a, a celebration or commemoration of the Spanish Armada. This was the, the, the the commemoration of the biggest sea disaster that mm. ever befell our coast. Just imagine a thousand men lost their lives on that little piece of beach. It's just, just, just unbelievable. And that's what we should be celebrating and commemorating and showing respect to. And as I say, there's the beach and there's the lagoons. Plenty of area. This is dries out at low tide. 
But if that was excavated there, and you could have the porter cabins, you could have all the facilities lined up there, and it would be just a tremendous project. I won't see it, but I hope some of you people will. Thank you very much.